Howdy. Welcome back to Dion Talk. Why housing is affordable. So quit your bitching. I get it. The struggle is real. High interest rates, high prices. It's really hard to buy a house right now. I'm going to give you two examples of why housing is affordable. Believe me or not, that's up to you. You are welcome to your own opinion. You are not welcome to your own facts. And this is my opinion, based on some facts and some of my opinion. I do my live streams every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific. So if you want your questions answered, during a live stream, this is when you do it. I'm on location, so I'm using two phones. I'm hoping I can be able to see your chat during the live. If you don't want your questions answered during the live stream by somebody who reached financial freedom in 10 years or less, even though they weren't starting in a good position and has been retired for two years now, trying to figure out how to spend money, you can email them to me, dion at diontalk.com. And then I can answer those questions either through an email or if it's good enough, I can make a video without releasing your name. But here's two reasons why housing is affordable, because that's what we keep hearing. People can't afford houses. The affordability index means that the average person can't buy the average house. High rates, high prices, high inflation, all of the reasons that people use as an excuse to not buy a house or to buy a rental. But here's two reasons why. The first is that affordability index that I talked about. Not only is it flawed, it's currently broken. It's not accurate. The idea is when you hear a news outlet source say something like, the affordability index is at a a record low. No one has the right data, right? For most of our life, you could look at the average income in an area versus the average home in an area. And you could say, 50% of the average people can buy the average home or 30% or 80% or whatever the current metric was. Because most people worked within an hour of where they lived. Well, in 2020, we had the pandemic. And statistically, this is the most likely period in our entire lives that people can work remotely. And we are years or decades, if ever, away from anyone knowing the average income in an average area. I live in a town called Port Orchard. I have people applying to my rental that is now available uh, who work out of Seattle, have multiple six-figure incomes, but can live anywhere in the state because they don't have to go to the office. And a lot of the statistics say this is not that big of an impact because 54% of Americans still have to go to the office to work. 54%. Well, let's do the freaking math. 46% don't have to go to the office. 46% of American workers are not required to go to the office. That's a big number. That's a lot of people who can make New York, California, Seattle income and live in Gary, Indiana. Or Tacoma, Washington instead of Seattle, Washington. Not only driving up rents, but driving up home prices. Because no one knows the average income in an average area. Not even the census. And they won't for years. So that's the first reason why housing is affordable. Yes, a person with the average income in Seattle is not going to buy the average house in Seattle. You have to make above the median income to be able to afford the average house. But if you can work remotely from Seattle and go out to Yelm, Washington and buy a house three times the size of what you would in Seattle for $400,000 instead of 1.2 million. Why aren't you? That's just the first reason. Here's the second reason why housing is affordable. And then I will get to the questions, which I'm doing the intro of this video to give you time to get your questions into the comments so that I can answer them on this somewhat short live stream. Normally my live streams on Tuesdays will go at least two hours and then we'll do a members only live stream or a course live stream at six where everybody jumps on Zoom together. But tonight I'm presenting at the, and I'll probably get the name wrong, Ryan, I'm very sorry, because you changed it. It used to be Oli REI, now it is Sound REI. Sound REI, an event in Olympia, Washington where I'm presenting tonight. 
hoping to educate some people that not only is financial freedom possible, but one, you can do it with a small portfolio, two, you can get your tenants to ask you to raise the rent, and three reasons why you might want to retire early. Hope to see you there. But here's the second reason why housing is affordable, and I'm going to actually use myself as an example. I talked about if you live in Seattle and you want to work remotely, you can go down to Yelm, Washington and buy a house for $400,000. Around 2000, so 24 years ago, I purchased a house, not as an investor, just as a homeowner with three kids to raise them in you know, a little white picket fence on a lake. I paid $100,000 for the house. Actually, I paid $98,000, wrapped $4,000 in closing costs into the loan with an adjustable rate mortgage, and I'm sorry I caused the 2008 housing crash. Me and Frank... We did it together. So we're sorry. But I bought it for $98,000, $100,000 for a house. Now, it was a three bedroom house at the time. I've added a bedroom. It's a four bedroom now. If you went to Yelm and you went to buy a four bedroom house now, it would be at least five, uh, four, four fifty, four hundred and fifty thousand dollars $450,000. So it's gone up 400% in value. Wages have not gone up 400%. So if you went off median income versus median home price, this seems unaffordable. Now, we'll put remote work in there, and you could say, well, yeah, that would make it a little more affordable because you can come from Seattle or California or New York or any of the places where you can make a higher income but no longer have to live there, and you can buy in Yelm. But let's take it one step further. Why does it cost $450,000? The house is the same. I mean, yeah, I added a bedroom, so that adds a little bit of value, not a lot. Adds a lot to the rent which I'm going to actually talk about in this unit of mine that I'm going to go and take a tour of um, because one of the reasons I'm on site is uh, there's four, four couples coming for tours tonight uh, to try to secure this rental. It is very hard to find a rental right now. If you're a tenant, the demand is high. The first qualified applicant for this unit came in 20 minutes. I'll, scare, I'll share the screenshots after I block out the names, but I posted it at like 9.29 and by 9.49 the same night, the first qualified applicant had applied. They haven't had a tour yet. That's when they're going to make up their mind. Um, then I posted my burr that is um, now available and then no kidding, not the first qualified applicant, but the first applicant, because they didn't qualify, was four minutes after it went live. That's the demand. And there's, um, we did two tours today. There's one that's doing a stop-by tour without me being there tonight. And there's two tours tomorrow. So there's a lot of demand for rentals at significant increases. I'm going to let you know on how this unit here, how a $700 expense, and I will show it to you, is making me $995 more per month. It's almost like owning real estate is a good thing for you or investing in stocks, or owning a business. There's several ways to reach financial freedom. That's just the one way that I chose. But here's why housing is affordable. When I purchased that house in Yelm for $100,000, it was a 45-minute drive to the closest grocery store. It was over an hour drive to the closest movie theater. There was no T1 internet, no fiber optics. There was a Doc in the box. There was no hospital. There was a family medical center where you can go see a, a family nurse practitioner. It wasn't even a doctor if you had problems. So, yes, the houses were $100,000 because we didn't have a walkability score. Now, there's a Safeway, there's um, Ace Hardware, Walmart, a movie theater. There's all of these things that are within 10 to 15 minutes of your house now. That is what increases the cost of the property. The area does, not the house, the area. So even in Washington, where housing seems unaffordable, if you go to any of the towns where it's a 45-minute drive to the closest grocery store, over an hour drive to any one of the, the movie theaters, um, Yelm had one blinking red light when I moved there. Now there's like six traffic lights. They've rebuilt the high school. They've rebuilt the middle school. All of the, the money and infrastructure that went into that town and the amenities that are available made the houses worth four or $500,000. So if you only make enough to afford a $100,000 house, then you need to move to a place where the houses cost $100,000. With remote work, that's possible. You can go to places like 
Gary, Indiana, if you work in Chicago, it's 45 minutes away. Hell, just that commute alone, even if you don't have remote work. My friend Millennial Mike purchased his first property, and my memory is terrible. I believe it was for $29,000. Now they're probably closer to eighty, ninety, dollars maybe even $100,000. With remote work, that's affordable. With a bit of a commute, that's affordable. Yes, yeah, scary is not the best place that you might want to live. Yelm, Washington is not the place you want to live. It's what the Apache called the boondocks. But housing is affordable. It's just not affordable where people want to live. Right? In 2000, when I bought that house for $100,000, people were screaming houses were unaffordable. Because if you wanted to live in Seattle, houses still cost more. If you wanted to live in parts of California, houses cost more. If it's, there's never been a year where people said, this is the year you should buy. This is the easiest year to buy a house. Everybody always says, and I get this comment often, it was so easy to start in 2010. And let me tell you how stupid that is, Skippy. In 2010, lenders disappeared. Lending criteria went through the roof. You were only allowed to have four conventional loans in your name instead of 10 like you can have now. Everyone was screaming, double dip recession, double dip housing crash, don't buy. All the prices are going to go down. Everyone in 2010 thought there's no way you can buy a house now. It's never been this hard before. Everybody in 2007 and 2008 was lucky because lenders would lend to anybody. But in 2007 and 2008, everybody was screaming, homes have been going up in price for five years. Nobody can afford this. Wouldn't you like to buy a property now for a 2008 price? It is affordable. I know people starting right now that are buying their places who started the process a year or two ago to get on the property ladder, starting their first or second house hack, buying a duplex instead of a house. I could have bought a house for the, the property that I'm on. I paid $525,000 for this property. It has three units on it. There's a duplex and a house. So I call it my triplex. One of these is an ADU. I'm not sure which one's which. Um, but let me know in the comments. Would you like me to go and do a tour of that unit. I think the Wi-Fi will work. Maybe. I think it dies when I get over there. But let me look at the comments really quick. Howdy, everybody. Thanks for joining me here on this Tuesday. Sorry, it's going to be such a short live stream. Uh, PE tuned or turned IE, uh, RE. Howdy, Curtis. A YouTube channel you should check out. A uh, PE teacher getting into rentals, letting you know that it can be done on a teacher's salary. I mean, he might have an OnlyFans, but I'm not sure. Off that check. We'll see Dion at Sound Rhea Meetup tonight. Thank you. That, that is the name. I got it right. I see we have a super chat. I'm going to get to that first. Jared. Howdy, Jared. This question is asked with love. I am curious if you have multiple wow pullovers or just the one. I have three. Uh, and I'm probably going to be replacing them with something Guild Wars related. We'll see. But I, I, I'm, I, uh, what's the Einstein theory? All of the shirts are almost all the same. I have the, if they're long sleeve, they look like this. If they're short sleeve, I had, um, true classic, you know, like 12 of them. And now I have 12 grunt style. So I don't ever wake up and go, what am I wearing today? I've never wasted mental energy on what I'm wearing. I have the exact same Danner Scorpion boots. I have the exact same Saucony running shoes. I have only two types of socks, long and short, dozens of each. So I never have to think. I uh, just put the clothes on and go. All my pants are the same. Millennial Mike picks on me about that. I, I now have like three sets of painting pants though, <laughs> but that are the same. So yeah, multiple pullovers all the same. Um, I would not be offended by anything that you ask, Jared. My mental energies are spent on, for the years, increasing cash flowing assets to reach financial freedom so that I never have to think about money. They are not, none of my mental energy was spent on, what should I wear? Howdy, everybody. <laughs> Chester, I thought we were still calling it Johnson, Indiana. It was Dennis, Indiana, because it had to be a name like Gary. Kent, howdy. I'll miss the member live stream tonight. There isn't one tonight. Working tonight, saving for that house hack. Uh, let me know how that goes. I'm I'm sorry the phone is shaking tonight. I do not have a holder. 
So it, if you watch Battlestar Galactica, it's just just think of their theme. Their camera was always shaking. Um, it's really high end editing I got going on here. No members only live stream tonight. There's usually two a month. We've done two this month and we'll probably be doing another one. Um, but it'll probably be next Tuesday, all for the month of May, the entire month of May. I believe, yes, the month of May. Because I have an event to go to on the 3rd and 4th for the Northwest Action Summit in Vancouver, Washington. Um, but we're doing course Zooms every Tuesday after the live stream for the month of May. And uh, there's a new price on the course. Uh, it's four forty-seven, I think. And uh, members-only live streams for May are going to be done on Saturdays or Sundays. I'll do kind of like a consensus during the live to figure out which day works for the most people and try to get you in there for that. The members-only are done where we literally look at deals. We open an email from an agent. We look at a listing that they sent somebody. And we go through the, the investor's train of thought on... What's the math work look like? And that's what most people focus on. But then we go through what are the physical aspects of the area? What are the things to consider with this specific property, like flood zone, other uh, neighborhood crime rate? And then we go through physical aspects of the property. Uh, might be somebody here for a tour. I believe it is. Um, and my tour guide, she would kill me if I put her on camera. It's going to give somebody a tour. Good luck. I hope you get it. $995 because I spent $700 on this place. After this tour, I'll take you through and show you. Hopefully the Wi-Fi holds up for over there. Um, and then for the members only, we go through the physical aspects of the property that might help limit tenant turnover. Or things like I did with this property that can make you almost $1,000 more because you spend 700 bucks. Hey Rod, howdy. You're lucky it took me six weeks to find the right qualified applicant. Did did get 15 other crappy applicants though. We've had, um, so we have two right now. That's rare for me. I've only had five tenant turnovers until now because I did finishing a burr. So this will be fifth turnover and sixth unit because I'm putting it on. So I'm, I've not done them two at the same time before. It is not easy. We are 50 plus inquiries on each property probably 12 applications that are qualified for this property. And I think like six or seven on the uh, Port Orchard property. And that's why I have a tour guide to help me. All you need to be able to do this is sixth grade math. Dock in a box, never heard that before. Yeah, Jason, that is uh, fairly common here in Washington. Flying out to Arizona tonight to finish up my second, two, two houses at the same time. Jared, congratulations. Jared does a very unique situ um, type of investing. Um, put the name of your YouTube channel in there, Jared. Jared, uh, private money lender. Um, you don't have tenants. You have customers, clients, members, because you do a different format, which we're going to be making a video on. Rob, Scary Gary, totally agree. <laughs> um Wealth building journey. Chester had an epiphany, a Dionism. If you work your entire adult life for a wage that is always losing purchasing power to inflation, by the time you retire, you'll be exhausted and broke. Is that an epiphany? I thought that was um, an American staple. It sucks. It really sucks. So I know this is going to sound super douchebaggy, and I'm going to try not to. Reached financial freedom at 52. Now at 40, I pretty much maybe thought I was going to work until I die. I think I told several people I'm going to work until I die. There's just no, no chance for me to retire early. I had a bunch of bad debt. I was only making $17 an hour. I'd gotten laid off from law enforcement. I was a single parent with three kids. Like everything sucked. And then I retired 12 years later. Like it was two or three years into investing before I really had some confidence that this was possible. And so I reached financial freedom. I had a decade of being frugal and learning how to invest the money and not spend the money on dumb things. Here's what bothers me. I mean, yes, I make jokes. The struggle is, if you've been living on less than $4,000 a month and putting every penny that comes in that's beyond what you need to live back into your business to buy the next rental, to upgrade the rental, to add $700 worth of stuff that gives you another $1,000 a month in income, 
And all of a sudden now you have $20,000 a month that comes in that you don't have to sell your life for one hour at a time. $20,000 in profit after you're setting aside over $4,000 a month for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. You pay zero in taxes because you used levered depreciation. How do you spend five times what you've been living on for a decade to get there? This is a hard thing to learn, but this is what sucks. I'll go out. Right? I generally don't go into stores, but I'll go into Lowe's or Home Depot because of the rentals. And I will see somebody in their 60s working. Now, if they have a love for hardware and they like dealing with people who are dealing in projects and, and they enjoy it and they, they don't need to work, but they do it because it gives them something to do. It gets them out of the house. Sure. But if it's like the people I run into who it looks like everything hurts. They hate their job. They hate that they had to get out of bed to go to work to deal with something that I need to buy at that store. Or the restaurant where the waiter or waitress is in their 60s or 70s. And they're not working because they love it. Or because they want social interaction. They're working because if they don't work, they die because they don't eat. That's hard to deal with. When the majority of Americans think financial freedom is not even possible. Look at the comments that come in on this channel. Absolutely so lucky to be you. It's impossible to do now. You did it when it was easier. 2010 when all the lenders disappeared. Or 2013, when prices went above 2008 and everybody said it's going to crash. Or 2015, when the first silver tsunami was announced, because we're getting the third or fourth one now. 2018, when rates went above 6% and nobody could buy a house. 2020, when we have a pandemic, eviction moratorium, a rent freeze, forbearance, massive foreclosures coming being announced, and all these reasons why you can never buy, never get into real estate, or never get into assets. Every single year, there's a reason for people to take to make an excuse. So we're here screaming from the top of the mountaintop that it's possible to make work optional or to just acquire a few cash flowing assets to grow a side hustle business, to have some income so that your retirement is better, even if you don't retire early. Yes, for a tour, Jason. Definitely. Soon as uh, Skippy McSkipperson is gone, I will do that. It was easy to buy in 2012 because Dion crashed the market. You are welcome. Manuel, howdy. I wish I had your stuff here to give you a toast. It was gone like two weeks later. Houses cost more in high demand places, but also rent is higher and appreciation is higher. Very true. One of the reasons why I like my investing strategy is the appreciation and rent increases are so much more than if I invested out of state. There, I've considered investing out of state, but to get where I am with a smaller portfolio, I'm, I'm happy that I invested in a high cost of living area. Deconstructing dreams. Howdy. As long as people don't deconstruct my segues, we'll be okay. Can you talk about why cap rates are flawed metric for residential investing? I wonder if this is, are you the same person that messaged me the other day? Thank you. I was actually going to make this video soon. So a lot of people who invest in multifamily will talk about cap rates because if you can increase the NOI on a property, you can greatly increase the value. So you just need a quick metric to figure out which ones to look at. But cap rates, much like the 1% rule, don't mean anything to current residential investors. So residential for me is four units or less because we have 30-year fixed rate debt. The 1% rule, separate topic. I'll talk about that if you want, but I'm going to stick to cap rates cap rates don't apply. I've never used them. I would not consider an investor that invests in four units or less that relied heavily on cap rates to be somebody I would want to get information from because it doesn't apply. Cap rates don't tell you anything about your property taxes. What if you're investing in Washington where your property taxes are $4,000 a year for a duplex? Or what if you're investing in New Jersey, and I always pick on Jersey, you're welcome, Adam. Do you get to Jersey much, Nash? Not if I can help it. Tell me the movie. It's $16,000 for a duplex in Jersey. So how does cap rate tell me if my taxes are four times the amount? What if the property you're looking at has an HOA fee or no HOA? What if one property in Florida is at the right elevation to where you don't need flood insurance? Or if you do need flood insurance, it's $8,000 a year instead of $1,000 a year. I've just named three things that can screw up the metric on a cap rate and bankrupt you if you're looking at residential with cap rates. So the per, if you're the same person, because your name is different than the email or the message I got, the, the person who asked me before, it was their agent saying, oh, you really got to look at the cap rate. It's the metric that matters. Agents are not investors 
over 90% of the time. It is absolutely okay with me if my agent doesn't understand how to invest. My agent's job is to find me the right deals and negotiate strong for me. I don't want them to understand the deals. They're, we're dating our agents, we're marrying the properties. When it comes to dating, my standards are a lot lower than my marriages, but that's a backfired several times. I didn't think that through. I forgot to, uh, Chester, I forgot to add the caveat that is as long as someone isn't investing in inflation resistant assets. Very true. Manuel, house hacking is the best hacking nowadays. Yes, give us the tour. Sure. I, um, hopefully the tour over there doesn't go on too much longer. Make up your mind or someone else will. Clint, first, David Pitchler. Howdy. That reminds me, if somebody is investing in Pierce or Thurston or Kitsap counties in Washington State and you need a real estate agent, reach out to me and I will connect you with a rock star. So I'd literally work with at least three agents at all times. And if my agent is watching this, he's going, really? Three? My last five deals went through the same agent because he is stellar. Clint, high interest rates and ridiculous home prices have made America home of the rich. That is a nanosecond of genius. Thank you, inflation, for making us rich. Yes, Chester, the event I'm going to is on May 3rd and May 4th. There will be plenty of Star Wars jokes. Bill, we need Dave for the jokes. Where is Dave? I think I made Dave mad. He was in the last members only, though. Rob, I think he works this time or something. Just get a boat and you won't have a problem spending money. <laughs> that is absolutely true. I did consider getting a boat instead of buying my last burr, and it probably would have been less work. Jared, looks like can't put the channel in this chat. It is YouTube REI Jared. At REI, Jared REI Jared. Maybe one of the moderators can throw that in there. Uh, Clinton, it is not like it was. Very true. Laura, tour, please. We will definitely be doing a tour. Jada, howdy. You said eight is when you can stop being frugal and start enjoying the money. Howdy. For me, it was eight. For some people, it might be five or four. See, I had the $89,000 in bad debt that I wanted to tackle before I started being not frugal. And uh, while I started house hacking and purchased the first duplex after two years, I was still in some of the bad debt. I found out about $89,000 in bad debt in my name I didn't know existed until the divorce. And so I kind of split. I've made some videos on this. Um, half of my discretionary income, which is everything above every penny it takes to live, half went to the house hack, half went to the not bad debt, worst debt. Right? There's three types of debt. Good debt, bad debt, worse debt. I'm trying to make good debt. Don't want to pay it off. Tenants will do that for me. So the last thing I want is another paid off property. Um, but bad debt, we want to tackle eventually. What we want to tackle first is that worse debt. Worse debt is something with a really high interest rate. That is subjective and completely up to you. And anything that has an adjustable interest rate because of the threat of what can happen in the future. So I was tackling worse debt for the first few years. And then as the cash flowing assets and the house hacking started increasing the savings rate, it was easier to tackle the bad debt. So by year eight, I was completely out of bad debt, made a huge mistake of paying off a house, which cost me a million dollars. That's why I don't want to do it again. And uh, at year eight, I started doing stupid things with money and continuing to save. Just not as much. Jared, the book Think and Grow Rich basically says this. If you think you can, you think you can't. You can't, right? So if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. So you should check out the book Think and Grow Rich. And anytime it's referenced, I talk about another book from basically the same era, both from over 100 years ago. Uh, it's Think and Grow Rich or The Richest Man in Babylon. Both of those are great reads. Buzz tuned to Jared. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. Appreciate that. Robert, howdy. Just used your binder strategy and worked like a charm. Instead of comparable rentals, I compared it to what college students would pay based on dorm cost, $200 increase, 10%. That's awesome. So yeah, I do. I use comparables. I haven't done the college thing yet. Um, that's if I had more college students, I might do that or was closer to college. I only have one that's close to a good college. 
Um, but I have used what Section 8 will pay and what BAH for the military will pay. And you can do that around colleges too, because people using their VA uh, GI Bill benefits will also get, or VA Voc Rehab, will get BAH in that area. $200 increase is a 45% net profit increase based on my current mortgage and expenses. This is what so many people don't get. A gross rent increase of 5 or 10% is a net increase of 30 to 50%. That's, it's massive. And I think uh, Robert would agree with me. That doesn't suck. Uh, wish I was in Hawaii. It's overcast and cold in Oregon right now. It is overcast and gray skies. I hope summer falls on a weekend this year in Washington. Actually, I don't because I don't have weekends anymore. Every night is Friday night. Clint, I'm from Oklahoma, but spent time in Vancouver, Washington. Nice. That is where I will be on the 3rd and 4th. <laughs> Deconstructing and trying to help with memory problems. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so I think I'm going to be wrapping this up in a minute. I'm wondering how long that tour is going to take. Because I don't want to walk in while the tenant is trying to look at the property and hold my phone out like, Hey, you're live. Hope you're not in Witsack. If you weren't here for the beginning of the video to save you from having to go back and watch it in future land, there are two reasons why housing is affordable. The first reason is the affordability index is flawed and broken. Because right now, 54% of Americans are required to go into the office to work. That means 46% are not. So remote working is more of an option than at any point in our entire lives. And nobody knows the median income for any area because of what remote working is doing. If somebody lives in Seattle, Washington, and is making multiple six figures, they can move to a place like where I live in Port Orchard, Washington, and work remotely. Go into the office once a week, take the ferry, or not go into the office at all. So if you make a higher income, you can move to a lower income place and buy a bigger house. That is affordable. That's the first reason. The second reason is, and I use myself as an example, when I first bought my house 24 years ago, I only paid $100,000, but it was in a town with one blinking red light. 45 minute drive to the closest grocery store, no Walmart, no Home Depot, no Lowe's, no movie theater. Now the houses there are $400,000, but yeah, there's a Walmart. The Home Depot bought a plot of land. There's a movie theater. There's several grocery stores from um, Safeway to, to all the, uh, the other chain stuff. If you found a place that it was a 45-minute drive to the closest grocery store that had one blinking red light and no movie theater, you could probably buy a house for $100,000 in almost every single freaking state. Housing is affordable. It's just not affordable where people want to live. And I think I'll just go do a walkthrough because he is taking forever. Here we go. Let's see how the Wi-Fi does. So, first, duplex. Um, I think one of those sides of that duplex was the original structure. And this is the house. The other side is a two-car garage with a shop. It's one of the reasons why the, one of the reasons why the rent is where it's at. It's compar comparably, I didn't find very many places with shops around here. And this is the tour for the people who hung around this long in the video. I will make sure I don't capture anybody else in frame and we'll hope that the Wi-Fi works because I don't think it will. I mean, I'm just kind of... Seems like my Wi-Fi didn't work. Hopefully it reconnected. And hopefully you saw the picture of the closet. I will explain the closet. I don't think the tour is going to work because the Wi-Fi didn't like me. So, I guess that won't work. Seems like it cut out when I went in there. But as soon as I get into the vehicle, I will explain what I was talking about. If it stopped there for a second at all. <clears throat> was there a picture of a closet? This was a two bedroom house with a den. I paid a contractor, handyman that's done several jobs for me now, 
$700 to frame, drywall, tape, mud, texture, a closet. I then came, I did the painting because I'm bored, and I put the trim. $700 expense to add a closet, which made it a third bedroom. And Section 8 would add $700 in the area, so I put the rent at $995 above where it was when the last tenants moved out because of the shop and have had significant demand for the place. So, good, you saw the closet. I appreciate that. When you look at properties, I've had several duplexes now where I purchased them, and it is a two-bedroom, one-bath, or two, one-and-a-half, but there is a third bedroom. It just hasn't been built. One of them, it just needed a wall added to a den. This one just needed a closet added to the den. And then you have a place where the mortgage is a fraction of the rent that it can make because the mortgage was you buying the place that had a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom like the house I bought where I added a fourth. I converted a car port garage thing, an open garage, into a fourth bedroom. This place I added a closet to a den. And then watch the rent go up. That doesn't suck. And doing this, my rent is still below the area average. That's the beauty of it. The person who selects this and moves in is going to be getting a better deal than the area average, but because I added a bedroom, I'm making significantly more profit. Because remember, our expenses do not set rents. That confuses a lot of people. They think, if I have a $1,000 mortgage, I better rent for $1,500. If I have a $1,500 mortgage, I better rent for $2,000 or whatever. That's not how it works. Tenants don't care what your expenses are. They just don't. If they did, a property with a mortgage and a paid-off property would rent for different amounts. And they don't. And I'm going to get ready and head to my event. So, until my next video, which will be coming out on Thursday, and it will be... Um, I hate my memory. I have the idea for it already. But I will see you Thursday. Have an evening full of awesome.